Revenge is motivation enough. At least, it's honest. Hate me, but do it honestly. The Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver series is a triumph of storytelling. Set in a dying and decadent world, it's easy to be enchanted by its rich characters, intricate plots, and complex themes of martyrdom, madness, free will, and the repercussions of time travel. Though, nothing quite prepares you for its magnificent dialogue, which alone is capable of standing next to the likes of classic Shakespearean tragedies such as Julius Caesar and Hamlet. Our story begins in Blood Omen, where we follow the title character Cain, a driven yet directionless noble whose petty ambitions pale in comparison to the momentous destiny before him. While on the road, Cain is ambushed by a group of bandits, who murders and impales the young nobleman. Desperate and thirsty for vengeance, Cain is offered a second chance at life by the necromancer Mortanius. Acting somewhat recklessly, Cain accepts the necromancer's offer, only to find himself reborn as a vampire. Now inflicted with an insatiable blood curse, Cain hunts down and easily dispatches his murderers. Convinced his quest is over, Cain is soon told otherwise by Mortanius, who states that those fools were merely the instruments of his murder, not the cause. Intrigued by the necromancer's words, and eager to find a cure for his vampirism, Cain sets off for the Pillars of Nosgoth. There he learns from the spectre of the former Balance Guardian Ariel that there is no cure for death, only release. Ariel instructs Cain to scourge the Circle of Nine, who are each tied to their respective pillars. The pillars are the embodiment of the divine force that preserves the life of the world. As long as the Guardians remain pure and uncorrupted, the world too shall remain healthy and pristine. However, each of the Guardians have been driven to insanity and are the reason why the land has become diseased. As long as they live, all of Nosgoth is doomed to an eternity of decay. Unconcerned for the fate of the world, Cain nevertheless accepts the role of executioner. He slaughters each of the guardians one by one, including the devious time guardian Mobius, and eventually acquires the legendary Soul Reaver Blade. Thus he restores the pillars, until finally coming face to face with Mortanius, who is in fact one of the nine, the guardian of death. Mortanius reveals that it was the necromancer himself who had orchestrated Cain's death, and had set off the chain of events that would lead to the destruction of the circle. Before meeting his own end at Cain's hands, Mortanius ominously warns the young princeling that there is one more life he must take. And so, we come to the moment which would shape the course of the past, present and future for not only Cain, but all of Nosgoth. Eight pillars had been restored, leaving just one left. The Pillar of Balance, belonging to Ariel's successor, born at the moment of her death, who in the past 30 years of his petty life had been wholly ignorant of his true role. Yes, as Balance Guardian, Cain is the last surviving member of the Circle. Ariel presents him with a fateful decision. Sacrifice himself to redeem Nosgoth, or refuse the sacrifice to preserve his own life at the cost of the whole world. At his whim, the world will be healed or damned. At his whim. Disgusted by all the lies and machinations, Cain selfishly refuses the sacrifice, embracing his vampirism for the first time and triggers the collapse of the pillars. He establishes his throne on the ruins of the corrupted Pillar of Balance, becoming Nosgoth's self-proclaimed monarch. He would later go on to plunge the tomb of the Seraphan, and raise six ancient corpses to serve as his vampire lieutenants. Raziel, Turel, Duma, Rahab, Zephon, and Malkia, who in turn would raise vampire clans of their own giving rise to an army of fledglings, capable of conquering the world in earnest. Five centuries pass between the events of Blood Omen and the second game in the series, Soul Reaver, during which time Cain becomes less and less human. As narrated by Raziel, the series' new protagonist, Cain would enter the state of change and emerge with a new found power. 
His flesh would twist and morph, with a crown now adorning his head, and hard lines and scars tracing his body. Some time following Cain, his lieutenants too would emerge with gifts of their own, until Raziel, the prodigal firstborn son, surpasses Cain by growing a set of bat-like wings. After Raziel faithfully served his master for over a thousand years, Cain violently tears off Raziel's wings and discards him into the abyss on what is believed to be a jealous whim. Raziel would eventually return from the abyss centuries later, hell-bent on revenge against his former master and brethren who betrayed and destroyed him. He emerges into the corpse of Nosgoth, learning that his clan had been completely decimated by Cain and finds the tyrant waiting on his throne at the very heart of the pillars he destroyed. It is during this confrontation when Raziel challenges Cain over the massacre of his clan that we get our first inkling that not is all as it seems, that perhaps Cain isn't simply the selfish king clinging to his seat of power, that just maybe there is more to Cain's motivations than pure spite, jealousy and ambition. Conscience? You dare to speak to me of conscience? Only when you have felt the full gravity of choice should you dare question my judgment. Your life span is a flicker compared to the mass of doubt and regret that I have borne since Mortanius first turned me from the light. To know that the fate of the world hangs dependent on the advisedness of my every deed, can you even begin to conceive what action you would take in my position? In the world of Nosgoth, integrity, servitude and faithfulness are not rewarded in kind. We are shown, time and time again, good intentions lead only to manipulation by predators striving to use such naive and gullible pawns for their own ends. In his youth, Cain fell victim to such deceit, and he has since learned from his experiences. His selfishness and acting in his own interests have served him well, while thwarting the agendas of many factions who would seek to rule Nosgoth for themselves. In Soul Reaver 2, the history of Nosgoth is flipped on its head. Upon arriving in Nosgoth's distant past, Cain starts to unravel the intricate conspiracy that led to the world's destruction, which he eloquently puts to Raziel. At the moment of my first cry, Ariel's beloved, the guardian Nupraptor, finds her corpse. Racked with grief and tormented by suspicions of treachery, Nupraptor plunges into a madness which overflows and infects all of the guardians who are symbiotically bound, including me. The repercussions of Ariel's assassination were expertly calculated. The entire circle descends into madness, and I am tainted at the moment of my birth, instantly rendered incapable of fulfilling the role destiny has prepared for me. Cain gives subtle hints regarding the guardianship of the Pillars. The Pillars were never intended to be served by human guardians, but belonged to the vampires. However, as the only surviving vampire left in Nosgoth, selflessly choosing to sacrifice himself at that crucial moment would have meant the complete annihilation of Cain's race. The Time Guardian, Mobius, made sure of that. Cain's entire existence is encapsulated by an impossible choice. He metaphorically compares his dilemma at the pillars to the fall of a two-sided coin. If the coin lands one way, the world is saved at the cost of his entire species, with new human guardians for the pillars susceptible to further manipulation. If the coin lands on the reverse, Cain lives on to raise a new generation of vampire spawn, but the world is forever left dying and diseased. Either way, the game is rigged. However, we come to know what Cain seeks is a third option, a way out of the dilemma thrusted upon him. Only through Raziel's rebirth as a creature with free will can Cain further his goals to change history and reclaim his intended destiny. You said it yourself, Cain. There are only two sides to your coin. Apparently so. But suppose you throw a coin enough times. 
Suppose one day it lands on its edge. This edge of the coin is Kane's gambit against the artificial fate devised for him. Now looking back to when Kane cast Raziel into the abyss, I cannot help but reconsider the pained look on his face. This isn't an expression of spite, anger or even jealousy, but a face of doubt and anguish. This was a painful but necessary act to deal one last hand to play against fate. At its heart, the Legacy of Kane series is about causality and free will. The series constantly pits the protagonists against authoritarian figures who remind them of their impotence in the face of inevitability. It makes us question whether free will is only an illusion. Are we all just pawns to history, following a predetermined path because we are compelled to, because we are always meant to meet this particular person, or play this particular role? Or are we free to choose our own fates for ourselves? Having been wronged dozens of times, Cain struggles to answer this question by striving to escape manipulation, engendering his desire to conquer all of Nosgoth for his own. Although we might never get a conclusion to the series, I like to think Cain succeeded in his goal to return the pillars to their rightful inheritors and ensure Nosgoth's restoration to its former glory. Perhaps one day, someone will continue the story, as was intended in the unfinished Dark Prophecy game. Until then, we can only contemplate and wonder, what if?